creating tools for enlightenment, not just as teachings, not just as practices that one can do, but living tools that people can walk through, living tools by which people can be impacted towards that process has always been the great desire of the yogis. One of them who had such a desire fixed me up for the job. This is my guru's will and grace. What are lingas? Lingas are transmitter of non-physical energy which we can only experience. There would be no showcasing of some effects or something outside but in our experience we would know that it surely is different. Uh it's something beyond my intelligence. I'm very lucky to be a part of it. I never expected to be like, like this. For that, let's understand what consecration is about. If you transform mud into food, we call this agriculture. If you make food into flesh and bone, we call this digestion, integration. If you can make this flesh or even a stone or even an empty space into a divine possibility, that is called consecration. If you want to know this dimension, you need devotion in your heart. of Bhairavi neither have to live in concern or fear of life or death, of poverty or failure. All that human being considers as well-being will be his if only he earns the grace. Consecrating a Yogeshwaralinga, in what way is it different? Why? When formless dimensions of existence take to a form, the geometry of that form determines how that particular form is going to function. I only wish that uh, every one of you 
actually see what's happening here. If you don't see things beyond physical nature, largely spiritual process will be just talking spirituality. Unless you really taste something, spiritual process will be an entertaining factor in one's life, will not become the mainstay. So making spiritual process the mainstay of one's life means that you have understood that, that source of life cannot be a sidetrack. But I want you to see something else, something beyond physical nature. If this has to happen, I want you all focused. It should feel like one breath, one being. Then everything that's in my experience will become yours. I want this to happen. I want you to make up your mind that you want it to happen. This is a medium, this is a seed, this is a possibility which will move you from a compulsive state of logic to the magic of life. My blessing is, let something that you cannot understand, that you cannot grasp, that you cannot contain within yourself, let it happen to you. May you be overwhelmed by life. May you be overwhelmed by this tremendous phenomena that is creation and creator at the same time. So each linga is made uh, accordingly to… for a specific purpose, for a specific deity, for a specific characteristic or aspect of us, who we are. These aspects are non-physical in nature. For example, you can say clarity in life or uh, your ability to use your speech, your work, shakti or other aspects of who you truly are. This is done in a, a very refined, sophisticated way so that it recognizes anybody based on how their energy situations are, where the status of life is right now, what level of evolution, how it is in that sense. But there are other deities which is very common in southern India which is probably uh, these days lost in north is we have Kula Devatas or Kula Daivams. That means a particular deity created for a particular Kula. Kula means a smaller segment of a caste. So here the genetic map of this Kula is kept and the deity is consecrated to serve only that type of genetics. This is why this fight in the villages, any inter-kula uh, marriage or inter-caste marriage means why they're struggling is, then you won't have a god of your own. You will become outcast. Well, that's taken on a social dimension and are ugly forms, that's a different matter. But essentially it is coming from this fundamental understanding because you have created an energy form which takes care of this particular genetic uh, information. If somebody who doesn't belong to that comes, it won't respond. So these things were done in a very scientific way for different purposes. There are many uh, fantastic processes even today, but mostly lost. So it is better to create universal things which are not based on genetics but based on the evolution of one's energy. That is what we are doing, that is why these new temples, which will not recognize you by genetics, it will not like recognize you by your parentage, but will recognize you for what you are right now. So, both these things were done right from ancient times, but most of the temples were done for genetic material because that is what people would fund. They want a specific temple in their town for their clan, so that their well-being, they created those things. A few were created for everybody's well-being. On Shivaratri, we offer honey, milk, on Shivlinga. Is there a scientific reason behind why we do that? 
milk and honey is offered because most of the lingas that you're offering to are stone lingas, all right? A stone linga which is kept for worship or whatever else it may be, if you don't feed it with some kind of fat or oily material, either ghee or milk or something like this, it will crack, it will become brittle and crack over a period of time. So, periodically you have to apply either oil or ghee or milk or whatever you like, something which… through which the stone can absorb fatty material so that there is integrity to the stone. So, once you're worshipping something, you don't want it to crack up. That's more like a maintenance of… It is a certain maintenance. And also, it… it makes the linga, if it is properly consecrated, it'll reverberate better if it remains wet. See, if you apply oil or ghee or even milk, the fat of the milk, the linga remains wet all the time. As I said earlier, you have to keep your body wet to receive. And similarly, linga has to be wet for it to exude this. These beings explored life in depth, looked at all aspects of human well-being and consciously structured the culture so that even the simplest act became a spiritual one. Spirituality has stayed alive and flourished for so many centuries in India because these beings created spaces and temples where they invested their knowing. Kailash is one such place, which is a powerhouse of energy. The first being to store his knowing in an energy form here was the Yadi Yogi Shiva himself. Though they are thronged by worshippers, the ancient temples were originally built not as places of worship, but as powerful energy centers which allowed people to transform themselves in a very deep way. A visit to the temple in the morning allowed one to go about his daily work with a certain sense of balance and depth. There was a deep and exact science of temple building. The temples in India were created according to the instructions laid out in the Agama Shastras. Each Jyotirlinga temple had a specific function. If you want health, you go to a certain temple. If you want material well-being, you go to another. Each temple was created to address a different aspect of life. The existing lingas in these temples have been consecrated for one or two particular chakras which benefit people accordingly. But many enlightened beings down the ages dreamed of a temple that held a linga with all seven chakras fully energized, a dhyana linga temple. Of all the temples, this is the most complex to create and so difficult is the task that it never happened. The closest attempt to consecrate such a Dhyana Linga took place almost a thousand years ago in Bhojpur in Madhya Pradesh. But the consecration process could not be completed. There is now only one place where a Dhyana Linga stands, the only one to be fully consecrated in over 2000 years. The Velyangiri Mountains are known as the Kailash of the South because they have been the abode of countless Siddhas, Seers and Sages since time immemorial. Shiva himself is said to have spent time in these mountains. It is at the foothills of the Velyangiri Mountains that Sadhguru Jaggi Vasudev established the Dhyana Linga. It took him three lifetimes of intense sadhana to achieve this. The 
consecration of Dhyanalinga involved an intense process of Pran Pratishtha which spanned over three years. Why is it a subjective science? Because the recipient has to be receptive to it. Otherwise, it won't. It will happen, but you would not notice it. So that is the difference of a regular science, of a, a sub, uh, objective science versus the yogic sciences, which are subjective sciences, hyper subjective sciences. Uh, so you have to perceive them. You have to see for yourself if it's true or not. Simply listening or learning to it uh, would not help. It won't be true for you. The sole difference between uh, is it working or is it just fake is simply that you will experience it. Prior to intellectualizing it, you should experience it. Only then it is true for you. This is the whole uh, starting point for yogic sciences that your experience precedes your intellectualization. Only first you perceive it, observe it, witness it. Only then it could be true for you. In India, it is tradition that prior to entering any temple, one is required to wet one's entire body to help make one more receptive to the energies of the temple. The Tirth Kund is a subterranean tank with a solidified mercury lingam immersed in water. This Rasa Linga was consecrated in a particular way fundamentally as a preparatory tool to enhance spiritual receptivity in a person before he enters the Dhyanalinga. The Tirth Kund's energy-soaked water has an uplifting effect on the physical body in terms of health and well-being and stabilizes the pranic imbalances in a person. scientific community has a lot of issues with linga so how is it working is it real or what it is well since the experiences are out of the articulate range hence the communication the ability to write or note it down is unavailable slightly hence it's difficult for normal scientists who have not witnessed it who have uh, not uh, observed it if they simply start to intellectualize it it's rubbish to them and it's not true for them this is the great thing about yogis. What others are unable to even articulate, they are being able to manifest or establish it by Prana Pratishta. There is a whole lot of testimonial around it. So in case you think, no, 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 it should be all removed and destroyed. It doesn't work well for people whom it's working, it's working. So you have no right to say that, oh, it's not working for me or in my thought, it's not valid. So in existence, it should not exist. You should not try to intellectualize first and then try to extrapolate that, oh, this can exist and this cannot. The beyond intellect thing simply means this, that by intellect, you cannot reach there. By only by observation and experience, you can reach there. By witnessing, you can reach there. Then you can look back at it by intellectualizing. Alive, because of little bit of cracks that have happened, some disturbance has happened to the whole thing, but still there. I just demonstrated, I felt this and then because they had to see, we put the Rudraksh and showed them how at different places, how the linga behaves differently. So, this work has been done in the past plenty, but when very, you know, when my way or no way attitude came, these things were all raised to the ground in many ways. Otherwise, whole of Europe was full of temples like this, consecrated spaces like this. This freedom comes when the intermediate dimension of what we call as the five sheets of body, the physical body, the mental body and the other two, the etheric and the bliss body, which carry a whole lot of information about who you are. When the intermediate aspect of pranamaya kosha or the energy body is very active, everything that is stored inside doesn't 
take a toll on your body and mind. We don't know what kind of sack of karma you are carrying right now, but the important thing is to separate it from your daily activity, to separate it from the way you are right now. This moment, how you are, is determined by you, not by the karmic substance that you carry. If you allow that to decide, everything becomes compulsive.